hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, looks like we have a worldwide audience today. Um, my name is Michaela Underdahl. I work at the marketing department at Nimble. And today I'm really excited to have Anita Nielsen here. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. And we are going to be learning about how to use the principles of psychology and persuasion in your sales organization. So like I said, my name is Michaela Underdahl uh, at Nimble. I am responsible for uh, talking to our customers about how they use Nimble and then working with uh, other people in the marketing department on developing resources and basically teaching other customers how Nimble can help them to get more organized, capture all the information about their prospects and customers correctly. So not only them, but everybody else in the organization can easily find it and use it to develop and nurture the relationships. And most importantly, we have Anita here today. She's the president and owner of the LDK Advisory Services. She is a best-selling author and sales performance coach with over 20 years of cross-industry experience in B2B sales and sales enablement. Anita serves senior executives and sales leaders by implementing powerful sales enabled programs and leveling up their sales teams to drive profitable growth. And Anita's Psych to Sell Masterclass teaches sales professionals key principles of psychology and persuasion that help buyers make decisions in the sales pros favor and turn them into customers for life. Anita, thank you so much again for joining us. I am very excited about your presentation. I am stopping to share my screen. I will make you the presenter and you have the stage. All right, let's see here. Sharing. So when technology works for me, we celebrate. Okay, just a second. Um, first off, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It always feels so weird when someone's looking at your bio, especially since I don't get to tell people that when they think 20 years, try not to do the math in your head. I'd prefer if you didn't do that. But um, I'm just happy to be here. It's been such a joy working with you um, at Nimble. The team has been great. And I'm excited because today I'm going to talk about some things that are part of my Psych to Sell class. So I'm going to get started. I've got a lot of content for you guys today. So the thing that I want to start with is I work with a lot of sales leaders and I'm constantly, um, you know, looking with CROs or with SVPs of sales. And one question that I love to ask uh, when I'm doing my discovery is, you know, what is your biggest challenge? And inevitably, one of the top three challenges that comes up is my salespeople don't know how to articulate value, <clears throat> excuse me, or they can't sell value. And I listen, you know, I let them ask their question. Then I say, I try not to be snarky about it, but I'll say, okay, well, what does value mean? And I can tell you, I have yet to get the same answer twice because value isn't something that I think can really be defined. Basically, the way that we need to look at value as sales professionals is that value is in the eye of the customer. What do I mean by that? In sales, the most important thing, and actually where the rubber hits the road is, you know, not what the marketing team has defined the value to be, not what the product organization has told you the value needs to be. The thing that matters as a sales professional is what does that customer perceive to be valuable? And it very much can be different than what is in your formal value proposition training. And so it's really important that you take the time to understand what value looks like to that customer, because it may be different um, than what even you think would be valuable to them. And so, of course, how are you supposed to figure out what's valuable to a customer? I'm glad you asked. Uh, it goes back to discovery, right? One of the things that we learn as salespeople very early on is that discovery is a critical part of the sales process. And we have to do a good job with discovery because, you know, it, it sets us up to be successful throughout the entire um, deal. Well, the thing is, when we do discovery, we, we're taught in sales 101 that you have to ask open-ended questions, right? Um, the, the truth is there's questions that are even bigger than just your general open-ended questions and we'll talk about those today but in discovery it's not just about getting the information and the fa just the facts ma'am right it's about how you make a connection with the innermost emotional challenges and perspectives of that customer so their tipping point the customer's tipping point often in the process comes to that moment where they actually feel understood right and they they've trusted you enough to share what their challenges are and they feel like you actually understand them and that you're talking directly to their needs. So you wanna make sure that your um, discovery process is shaped so that you can capture their perspective. So one of the examples I like to give for this is, 
imagine there is that you're um, working with a IT leader who's, you know, for security services, for example. You could stand there and tell them all the value of the security services and how this vulnerability and that pen test and all the different techno technical reasons why the product is superior or your service is superior. But at the end of the day, what is the most important thing or what is the thing that is on the mind of that security leader? It's if I if my organization gets breached, I'm out of a job. Right. And my personal credibility is on the line if this company has some sort of a breach where, you know, numbers of social security numbers are compromised, et cetera. So that's what you want to tap into, what that underlying motivation or that underlying emotion is. And in this case, it's fear, it's concern over one's reputation. And those are the types of things that now when you go in and do some messaging and you're talking to your customer, you make sure that you reassure them about that, right? And how this is going to help ensure that, you know, you continue to enjoy um, your career as somebody who's a leading uh, person in cybersecurity and have been able to manage getting this organization to be secure despite all the challenges that are going on um, today. So, you know, the discovery is that first chance that you have to get their perspective, but also elevate their experience. It's a very different experience for a customer when you are just asking them questions and digging and trying to learn about them, then if you are um, you know, learning about what matters to them and having a conversation. So I would say to look at discovery more as a introductory type conversation where you're really just kind of learning about one another. All right, so what does it look like? What does a powerful discovery look like? Well, there's three components to it. There is a preparation, there's high impact questions and active listening. Now, if you're looking at this going, oh my God, this is so 101, sure, you might think that right now, but I can promise you the amount of salespeople that know these things and then actually put them into practice in their actual discovery calls is very slim. And it's because I think sometimes as sales professionals, we want to be really effective and we want to get to the point. We don't take a moment to take a step back and say, okay, look, what are the things that I need to make sure that I get out of this? So let's talk a little bit more about that. When we look at preparation, there's three components that I like to think about when I think of preparation. The first is research. The second is a call plan. And the third is your mindset as a sales professional. So digging in a little bit to research, you know, in order for you to have some credibility with your customer and this introductory discovery conversation, you need to have done some research. You need to understand at a minimum, I mean, I'm talking table stakes, right? Like what their vision is, what their mission is, what their company is doing, what's in the news. That stuff you really need to know and you have to be able to have an intelligent conversation based on what you learned. As well, those questions, those will, um, those, in, that information that you get will inform the questions that you'll ask. Here's the thing though, you have to do more than just the usual suspects like the Google or discover.org or LinkedIn, the company website. As a sales professional, you wanna get into every nook and cranny that you can out on the internet to figure out what makes this company tick, what makes this individual tick. And you're gonna to wanna to look at sites like Glassdoor. You're gonna to wanna to look at uh, Twitter and buyer forums and Reddit. Anything that you can get your hands on that's gonna give you some insight either into that company or the challenges that people of that role in that company are facing. And it's really important. I mean, those re that research is gonna inform your questions. So you'll get to have intelligent questions that are gonna let that customer know that you're credible and that you're not just someone coming in here you know, coming up with questions that are things that you could have gotten answered on the website. So a couple of things at play there, but research is really important. And I'll be honest, I would say probably the percentage of people that do thorough, thorough research as sales professionals, I'm, I'm being generous, I think, when I say 30%, right? It's just not something that we've historically placed a lot of value on. In today's world, the customers are researching the heck out of our companies and us in order to be... Um, kind of in the same boat, we need to make sure that we understand them and that we've done all the research on them. All right, so then next thing is a call plan. And this is just an example um, that I took from my book. But basically what, what I mean by call plan is, you know, just you wanna get the basics done in a call. You know, you have to figure out the budget, the timeline, the decision maker. As sales professionals, we know we have to get to that. By putting things in a call plan, it allows you to really think through what your outcome is. What is it that I'm trying to get out of this call? What does the customer need to get out of this call? Um, how am I going to manage their perception? What, what changes in perception need to take place for me to be able to advance in the sales process? Just spending some time, and I'm not saying, believe me, I understand that we don't love to do documentation. I'm not saying fill out a form for every call, but if nothing else, just spend a little time in advance and think through, 
you know, how am I going to get to their emotions? What can I do to understand their motivation? Right. And how will I shape their perception throughout the way that I simplify this? And it's something that I'm actually one of the students in my class told me they put a little post it note in their car and it just says, and I said this in class, you know, what do I need that customer to know? What do I need that customer to do? And what do I need that customer to feel? If you can just talk through that in your own mind before you go in, whether or not you have a document, you're going to be in the right mindset to have the conversation you need to be able to really get to what is motivating them. And that kind of goes to mindset, which is a third component. By mindset, I mean, what is, what's in your head, really? Like, are you going in there from a place of empathy or compassion? Do you have good intent? And that's one of the ones that I'm very adamant about when I teach my courses. If I'm going to teach you something about psychology, you have to go in there with good intent. If you don't, it'll either backfire or you will end up manipulating someone, which is the last thing we need um, as professionals in sales to have somebody out there doing that. So you know, go into your conversations with your customers with the intent that I'm here to make you successful. All right, curiosity, very important. Curiosity fuels the questions that you need to ask to get to the emotions and to the motivations. You know, authenticity, this word gets thrown around all the time, but I couldn't not put it here because it's just, it matters. If you go in to a customer acting like the stiff, um, you know, super professional salesperson, that's the kind of uh, person that you're going to get back, right? They're not going to let their guard down. They're not going to, you know, just meet you um, in a place where it can be conversational if you go in, you know, kind of just thinking that you have to be something that you're not. Be who you are, and that will speak volumes to the customer in terms of, you know, what they're going to be working with. And that actually is going to matter more to them than any facade that you could put on. So the last thing that's important when you think about um, mindset is you want to orient your thinking to that person, not to your product, not to their challenges, but to that human being that you're selling to. Look, at the end of the day, we talk about B2B sales, you know, a business is not selling to a business. There's not a building having a conversation with a building. You've got two humans that are discussing their needs, their challenges. You've got somebody who needs help with something and someone who's got the potential to help them. That is a human conversation and it is about the people, not, not the products. That's secondary. Applying the product to that person's problems only comes after you really truly understand their problems and their motivation, et cetera. Okay. So that takes care of the first phase of discovery. So now let's look at the second one and arguably the most important high impact questions. So these questions, like I was mentioning earlier, you know, these are a little bit more than just the regular open ended questions. And I'll give you some examples about that in a minute. But basically, these are really probing questions and they get you to a deeper level with the customer. And what I like to say is, you know, the emotions seep in by asking these types of questions. You give your customers um, and prospects permission to talk about what matters to them and to let their emotions kind of show through, which is not something that you do with even standard, you know, open ended questions that you're taught about in sales 101. Right. And I only half joke when I say this. Now, these questions would make shrinks jealous. Um, you know, my background, a lot of my background is in psychology and I've got a best friend who's a psychiatrist. And what I can tell you is that people that are working um, in those fields, they are dealing in emotions. And one of the things that is really important to a therapist or psychiatrist, et cetera, counselor, is learning what the emotional makeup is of someone when they meet them. And in order to get there, they ask questions that are going to do exactly what I'm asking you to do here. Give the customer permission to open up and share what matters to them. All right, so let's do an example. It's a little bit hard to understand without one. <clears throat> so if you want to learn about their challenges, you know, the com one of the common open-ended questions, no brainer is going to be, oh, what are your challenges? And no one's going to convince me that salespeople don't go in and ask this question very frequently. We do. What's the high impact question version of this? Can you describe how you're handling your challenges? Now, someone I'm sure will argue with me that they're different questions a little bit. But when you ask the second question, the high impact question, you're going to get the information around what their challenges are. But now you're also going to get the personal perspective on the challenges, right? It's not just about what are your challenges. It's how are you handling them? Which ultimately to you as a sales professional, what matters most isn't so much that list of challenges, but how are they navigating them? What are they doing to address them? I think that's really important. The high impact question, it takes you to the next level. Inevitably, they're going to have to tell you their challenges to answer that high impact question. So you kind of get a whole nother level of information, both emotion and logic, when you ask um, a high impact question. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
the common open-ended question for when you want to learn about initiatives you would say something like okay what's your top priority initiative this year what's the thing that's you know that is highest on your list of things to achieve this year great question and absolutely as sellers we want to know what that is well what if you ask something like help me understand how you assign priority to your initiatives again the initiatives will come out in this conversation but by asking them how they assign priority you are going to get a ton of information about what matters most to them right sometimes the answer will be oh the priority is going to be whatever the ceo has read about that week um, it's going to be whatever the business unit is crying about the loudest you're going to learn their perception about different people within their organization their perception of their role in the business Etc. Just a whole bunch of different feelings that are going to come out in that conversation, you know. And then from there, you will find out what's your top priority initiative this year. You're going to hear about what the priorities are, how they prioritize, and then you can ask, "Hey, what's your top priority this year?" So this typical open-ended question just naturally follows from the high impact question, but the high impact question gives you the ability to get a lot more right off the bat. All right. So just kind of a cheat sheet. Um, it's not hard to do questions that are high impact. This is your cheat sheet, do a screenshot. When you wanna ask these types of questions, you can almost always put these things in place. Like, can you describe? Tell me about, how would you? Give me an example of, just put in the second part of that question and you will get so much more than you would if you just asked a simple open-ended question. Now, like I said, how do you feel? Maybe not so much, that's a more shrink humor for you. Don't ask that. Um, people will think you're creepy, right? Unless you're in the right situation, when you first meet someone, you start asking about feelings, you might give them the heebie-jeebie. All right, okay, so I'm gonna pause for a minute. I wanna just kind of tell you a story I'll, I'll share with you. So Tina is a 55-year-old uh, friend of mine and she's got two kids, um, her son Alex and her daughter Ivy. So Ivy's 17 and she's a senior in high school um, and Dylan is 12. Oh, sorry, no, Ivy is, hang on, Ivy is 17 and she's a senior in high school. Alex is 26, her other child is Alex and he's 26 and he's got two kids. So Dylan's 12, the grandchild, and Amber, who's almost three. So of course, Tina, right, like she's constantly talking about how she dotes on them and how she spoils them. She brags about, you know, how great these kids are and she only half jokingly says, oh, they take after their mom, which I swear she really is only half jokingly saying that. Um, she talks about Dylan and how much he likes to play football and skateboard. She said that it's lucky, though, that he's really good at school because he kind of sucks at the football and skateboard part of it. You know, Amber, who's at such a fun age, um, she constantly talks about how she's getting into everything, but how she's got the best of all things in her giggles and how she loves to give hugs. Can you tell this is a doting grandmother? Um, you know, what she loves, to, what Amber loves to do is to play, pick on the dog, though. That's another thing that I always have to hear about. But you know what, Tina, ultimately, she always says to me, it's really fun to watch them grow. And I think she kind of says that to me from one mom to another. You know, but the thing that she says that cracks me up is the best part is that she gets to spoil these children and then hand them back to her kid, to her son. And, uh, you know, I kind of feel like it's a little sinister there, but I'm not a grandparent yet, so I can't really confirm that. So I want to ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, do you know Tina's daughter's name? And of course, I can't see your answers. So you can go ahead and answer within the chat box if you'd like, or the questions box, sorry. And then the next question is, what grade is Ivy in? I'm not able to see your guys' questions or where you're typing. Um, what is the grandkid's mother's name? What's Dylan good at? What's the age difference between Dylan and Amber? And how about the age difference between Alex and Ivy? So I think you by now probably get where I'm going with this. Those are some basic questions about the story that I told you, but how many of you actually feel like you knew the answer to them? I would venture to say, and I wish I could figure out exactly, but I don't think many of you because one of the biggest challenges we face as human beings first and then as sales people in particular, you know, we listen with the intent to reply or to keep moving on. We don't listen with the intent to understand. Um, and anybody who tells me that they are the best listener, I just don't believe you because it's something I think that all of us struggle with, um, you know, especially in sales, because we are trying to be effective and we do want to get to the next step. We've planned what the outcome of the call needs to be. So sometimes we're not listening to what that customer is saying. We're thinking about what's the next thing we're gonna say. 
that's going to make them want to listen to us further. It's going to make them want to trust us and buy from us. You know, the thing, Alex, because you felt like someone was listening to what you said, like truly listening. It just doesn't happen that often. The trick, though, is, you know, we talk about in sales, we say, oh, people love to um, talk about themselves. And that's true. But I can tell you what they love more and just basic as human beings is to feel heard. So it's not just enough to listen to them. You have to make sure that they understand that they are being heard. And that's where active listening comes in. It's not just about the listening. It's about how you shape their perception about your listening. And so what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's different things that you can do. And, you know, I say these tips will change your life. And I say life on purpose. These, these types of things of active listening, it's not only going to help you in your career, but it'll help you in your personal life. It'll help you in conversations that you have. Again, we're human beings buying from human beings. We're human beings related to human beings. This is something that's valuable to human beings, knowing that they're feeling hurt. Um, you know, especially if you've got teenagers like I do. I never feel hurt. So when I think someone's listening to me, I'm all in that conversation. And I'm all grateful for that person. So here's something that you could say. When they're, once they've, um, a customer's kind of given you their initial comments for an answer to a question, and then you can just say, thank you for sharing that information. It's important to me because this is going to help me better understand how I can help you. Now, obviously don't use these words. You'll sound like a robot because it's not your words. But you get the point here, right? You want to make sure that they understand that you're asking this information because the more you understand, the more you're going to be able to help them. I think a lot of us as salespeople, we take this for granted that customers just know that that's what we're doing. You know what? It doesn't hurt to remind them because a lot of times I think they get lost in the shuffle in their mind because of how other salespeople maybe have treated them in the past. All right, the next one is, you know, yes, sometimes we are going to be thinking about the next thing and that's okay. Just know when you're doing it and then recover, right? Just look at the situation and say something like, can you explain that to me a bit more? Or mm, I don't understand. Or walk me through that. These really simple things, it kind of gives you a chance to catch up on whatever it was that you missed. And from a customer standpoint, they're going to like the fact that you, you're able to say, I don't understand. I mean, some of the perception of salespeople is that we come in as know-it-alls, right? And that we're there to sell them something. Well, when you come in and say something like, I don't understand, or can you explain that to me? You immediately disrupt their viewpoint because they think that you're coming in there to sell them. You're coming in there to understand them. Once they see that, it makes it a lot easier for them to share more with you. Okay, mirror. And so, you know, some of you guys probably might think what I mean by mirror. It's a little bit different. Um, Chris Voss wrote an amazing book and it's called Never Split the Difference. But basically one of the things that he says in there that I found is super powerful for salespeople is, if a customer is answering um, a question that you've asked them, if you want to dig in deeper or if you feel like that question isn't giving you enough, take the last two or three words that they've said and repeat it back to them as a question. So, for example, if you say something like our top priority this year is to fund our um, nonprofit, you could say something like nonprofit. Now, obviously, you cannot say this the whole time. You will come off as a really big weirdo. But asking it in a question now makes them have to go back and repeat themselves in a way that will be different than what they just said to help you understand it. So it's just another technique to make them see that you are listening and that you want to learn more. Really, really important um, in the relationship that you're building with your customer. And then at the end, you know, you kind of want to say something like, look, let me recap what I heard today. Then just reiterate the top concepts. Look at your notes and please take notes, right? I know it's a little bit hard on the days of Zoom, but when you're in um, a meeting with a customer, take some notes. It makes them feel good that you are listening to them and who doesn't want to know that their words are being written down, right? And then you say, here's something that I think, here's what I think I heard. And you let them correct you or you let them agree with you. In either case, it shows how much you are engaged. And again, that's meaningful to your customer. All right, and this last one is, you know, did I get that right? What did I miss? And is that all? So once you're done asking the questions about, um, you know, kind of recapping and paraphrasing what they've said, now you give them one last chance and you say, look, did I get it right? What did I miss? And is that all? So at this point, when you're saying something like this, they recognize that you are not leaving any stone unturned in terms of getting where their head is at and figuring out what matters to them. And then you're ultimately going to use that power of knowing these things to help you um, come up with the best product or solution to to sell to them. All right, so let's see here. Once discovery and listening skills are sharp, you can move on to personalizing value. And this is really important, and I say this very deliberately, personalizing value. We've already established that value is in the eye of the buyer. 
So in order for your value proposition to resonate, it has to be personalized to that person and their perception. So you deliver on what that buyer believes is valuable. Once you know what it is, you figure out how to get in there and make it happen, right? And, and the thing about this is, you know, who you are and what you stand for, that is what will help you identify your opportunity. And no one else will be able to do it, right? So differentiation lives here. So what do I mean? So you know, if you're doing a discovery with someone, for example, and you learn, I'm actually I'll tell you a story about this. So I was working with a sales rep um, at one point and we were selling IT services and he was working with a client who you know, just wanted to be really strategic as an IT leader. And as they were doing their discovery, the client said, you know, I really am trying to get into Northwestern and get an MBA, um, you know, but it's been such a challenge and the application process is so cumbersome. And the sales rep was like, yeah, I can't even imagine, you know, congratulations, that's a huge step. And then, you know, the lunch that they were at when they were talking about this finished and the sales rep gets in his car and he's like, thinking to himself, God, what can I do? How can I help him? Um, you know, clearly his career is really important to him. That's what's valuable him, to him right now, more than what his company is expecting him to do. He is all about his ambition and what he needs to get done and the challenges with trying to get that MBA. And so the um, sales rep is driving and driving and all of a sudden he realizes, yo, I actually had a college roommate who ended up going into admissions somewhere um, let me see if I can get in touch with them and ask them if they can give me some tips and tricks about, you know, how to do well on your MBA application so that I can go share with my client. Like, how thoughtful is that? I mean, that is something that is totally a function of the experience of that salesperson. Well, I like to say, you know, luck favors those that are thoughtful. And in this situation, the sales rep contacted Ed was the name of the guy who was his uh, friend in college. And, you know, magic, he actually does sit on the admission committee at Northwestern. Can't make this up. This is not, I mean, this is absolutely true. And it just, this is how the world works, right? You go out there and you try to do everything you can to support your customer and things will start to fall into place. Will it be this magical? Eh, maybe not. But what I can tell you is that he introduced the customer um, to this admissions officer and they had a great conversation and the customer was really grateful. He's like, look, thank you so much. Now, We've been trying to sell to this customer for quite some time and nothing ever really came of it. However, within three months of that conversation and that uh, connection that happened with the admissions officer, magically there was a multi-million dollar opportunity that got signed, right? And the statement of work was in hand. Did it happen? Would anybody admit that that's why that person signed the deal because of this um, admissions officer meeting? Hell no, no one's going to say that. But I think we all know what drove that final decision, right? And the thing that ultimately ended up making that buyer realize that they don't want to buy from anybody else. All right. So, um, you know, we're moving to personalizing value. We want to deliver on what right, these are repeating here. Um, and then differ differentiation lives here. All right, guys. All right. So now we're going to move to my favorite topic, the psychology of a sales professional. Here's the thing, part of what we need to do as sales professionals is we need to recognize our own strengths and weaknesses. And that will help us make the best choices and the best um, decisions throughout our sales process. So here's the one that we always hear, and I will argue with you, I'll die on this hill. We do have a tendency um, to look at the world through rose colored glasses. But the thing is, as sales professionals, we have to be motivated. We have to be optimistic. This is a hard job. Right, like what would we do? Pessimists don't make it very long in sales because there's rejection, there's struggle, there's internal politics, there's customer politics. It's not an easy job, right? And so for people to be successful and to keep a positive mindset, you gotta focus on that. And you do look at the world through these rose colored glasses. But like any tragic flaw, that can also be our greatest weakness, right? So if we're looking at something through our optimism, we may not see something that is actually going to put our deal at risk. So how do we address this? Well, I put together something I call the answers. And we get clarity through those rose-colored glasses by working through this um, concept of the answers. Let me share that with you. So the answers are kind of, they guide the deal outcome. Now, it, this is kind of funky the way that it goes, but you'll be, you'll use it and you'll see how powerful it is. So as a as a salesperson, my customer needs to believe certain things before they're going to buy from me. If you think about what are some of the things that that customer has to believe in order to buy from me, and you position it almost as a question and recognize that, you know what, they have to be able to give me an answer to these questions. 
in order for them to want to buy from me? Clear as mud? Probably. Let me share a little bit more about that. So they're thinking through things consciously or unconsciously, but they have to have the answers to those questions in their mind, right? They need to be able to answer those questions with conviction and confidence before they buy. And you have to be able to empathize with them. You have to educate them, enable them, and empower them so that they can answer these critical questions that are driving the buying decision. And we'll give you an example about that in a minute. But they have to be able to do it without hesitation or doubt. So what does that look like? Well, you know, oh, by the way, if you have a deal that's stuck, try this theory, try using the answers, and it'll help you figure out why it's stuck. It's also kind of just a way um, to do qualification, right? So if asked, what would a customer say in response to these questions? So you're asking the questions, but what matters is their answer. What would be the answer? How will they address this, right? And, you know, have they convinced themselves? So let's give an example so that I can make it clear. So one of the answers that we that they have to be able to address is why do I need this product? They have to have a firm answer as to why that product matters and why they need to purchase it. Here's an example of it, right? I have to do this because the competition is differentiating and I'm not able to. So if I don't buy this, I'm not going to get the competitive advantage, right? That's a question that it very easily they can answer if they truly believe in what it is that they're buying. That's one. The second one is, um, you know, why my leaders, right? You could say my leaders are looking to me to figure out how we have to be more efficient and how we can deal with fraud prevention. And that's the reason I need to buy this product. Pretty important, right? That's something it, it talks about what their leader needs. And so that's a little bit important. Leaders looking at me, that talks about their career and what, their, um, what the perception of them is. Really important. Um, I need to buy this because the planning process is crap and it's killing our profit margins and we're not reacting as quickly as we should. Again, clear, crystal clear, powerful reason why they have to buy this product. As a salesperson, you need to be able to envision in your mind, if I am thinking of this question, why do I need to buy this product? What would my customer say? How would they answer that question? And that's what this is all about, right? So they better have a good answer for the following questions. Why do I have to buy? Why? What is, what is making me make the choice to buy right now? Why do I have to buy right now? What makes it important for me to make this purchasing decision at this moment in time? Why do I have to invest the money for this purchase? Like, why? Why must I buy from this company? What is it about this company that makes me need to buy from them? And the most important answer that they have to be able to give when you ask the question is, why must I buy from, and I put your name here, so you as a sales professional, why must I buy from Anita? Right, if they can't answer that question, not why must I buy from my sales professional or this account manager, the person, your name, who you are, what you stand for, makes an impact on your customer. They have to be able to be clear that they need to buy from you. And once that happens, now you have a deal that's qualified and regardless of rose colored glasses, it's probably gonna get to the finish line. Whereas if the customers cannot give a convicted answer for these types of questions, they're not going very far. And the reason that I've done it like this, and you know, you're probably thinking, well, this is just basically qualification. Yeah, it is. But how many of us are taking the time to sit there and go through the basic qualification questions? I'd venture a guess that not most of us, right? So this is just a different way to kind of play a mind game with yourself and force you to have to think about where is my customer's head at? So you have to literally put yourself in their brain and figure out how would they, what would they say? What would be their answer to this type of a question? And so it's the, their answers are what are going to determine whether or not they buy. If your deal is stuck, figure out where there's a mushy answer because that is what is making it stick. Is it because they can't figure out why they need to buy it now? Is it because they don't have a good answer to why they must make the investment? Whatever that gap is, that is what you as a sales professional need to now go fill and address. And then that is how you will unstick your deal. All right. All right, so let's do some quick key takeaways. I know I've zipped through a lot for you guys today. Do your research. Um, you know, we can't be lazy about this, you guys. It just, it makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. It makes us look unprepared and it makes the customer think, you know, how, how hard is it to go out there and just know the basics about us? Ask me questions that matter, that are relevant, but not the things that you can find out there easily. Ask high, high impact questions. Emotions drive behavior. We have to ask the types of questions that are going to make it okay for our customers and prospects to let their emotions seep into the conversation. 
listen to every single word. This will be probably the hardest thing that you're going to do because we are all so trained to just listen to a little bit and move on. Listen to their every word, not even so much because of what they're saying, but because they need to feel like they are heard. That is something that is invaluable to a customer in their life and absolutely in the sales process. Create personalized value. What matters to them, make that happen. That may or may not have to do with your product or solution. It's table stakes to be able to show the benefit and features of that product and what it's gonna mean to them in their business. That isn't going to differentiate you. What'll differentiate you is how much you were able to recognize their motivations, the things that um, matter to them on an emotional level and how you address those, right? Think about the um, leader in cybersecurity. You can't create personalized values if you don't do questions that get the emotions in there. You absolutely have to get to those emotions and those regular old um, open-ended questions aren't gonna get you there. So hopefully you took a little screenshot of the spinny wheel and those are the things that you can take any question and change it into a high impact question. And last but not least, you know what? Check yourself. When deals are stuck, go through the answers. If you feel like the customer, you're, maybe you're missing out on sharing something with the customer and they're just not quite where they need to be, walk through the answers, check yourself. Again, it's a mind game you're playing with yourself. It is forcing you to have to think, how would they answer the question? Instead of, oh, check, yeah, they need to buy now. It's a compelling situation. Oh, absolutely, they need to buy from us because we this, this, and this. No, it's about what would they say? How would they say it? They certainly aren't gonna say it the way that I just did as a salesperson or somebody working for a company does, okay? All right, so that is all I had um, just in terms of the information I wanted to share with you. But I think the, the most important thing that I can tell you is sales, like any other type of human interaction, is based on psychology. It's based on feelings and on logic. At the end of the day, emotions are what drive the buying decision. Logic is table stakes at this point. The way that I see it, you have to be able to go in there and tell them why this product is, why it's going to do what it needs to do, why it addresses their challenge. What's going to matter is that emotion. Like, do they trust that you are going to be the person that's going to have their back? Do they know that you are the person that's going to be there when something goes wrong? Do they know that you're the person that's going to make sure that their career doesn't tank? Those are the types of things that are going to make them pull the trigger and differentiate you and by the way, once you do that, for example, the um, person that wanted to go get an MBA, not only are they going to buy from you in that moment, but when they move on to another organization, which by the way, this person did, one of the first calls they're going to make is to that salesperson who helped them when they were at their previous role. Now, assuming that delivery does everything they're supposed to do, but that is a whole nother webinar. So remember that you are dealing with humans. As long as humans are doing the buying, it is very important for you to rely on the things that make you uniquely human. Your empathy, your compassion, you know, your curiosity. So do not lose sight of those. And you know, part of the reason I wrote Beat the Bots is because I don't think that sales professionals are at risk as long as you are doing things like addressing human emotion and doing things that are uniquely human. Until a robot can be empathetic, I'm not sure that we're gonna be worried about our jobs and I'm not seeing that in this lifetime. Uh, hope I don't get proven wrong. But in the meantime, differentiate based on who you are and what you stand for. And then just for today, just for listening, thank you so much. It's always so weird when you're doing a webinar, like I can't see your faces, but thank you for listening. I hope you were able to get something out of this chat and um, I'm guessing with how much I sped through it, you probably will have some questions and we'll go to those next. But what I'd love to do is, you know, discovery questions, it'll take you some time to get used to it and the hang of it. So um, yeah, I want to be able to share with you an ebook and that's going to give you a head start to take some of the things we've talked about today and actually go out there and use them, right? Because that's where the rubber hits the road. You can listen to hundred webinars, but if you don't take what you've learned and go apply it and see how it works, it, you will not get the return on the investment of your time. So um, email me at, this is my email address, amynielsen at ldkadvisory.com. And just let me a little note, what'd you think about today's webinar? And tell me um, that you'd like the ebook and I'll send you a link so that you can download it. Again, it's high impact questions and I've got them categorized by what are the types of questions that are gonna help you get the table stakes or the logical and um, baseline answers? What are the questions that you're gonna ask that are gonna help you get the emotions to get into the conversation? So really a high impact questions that you can absolutely use. You have to just tailor them a little bit to whatever your industry is. All right. And that is all I have. Michaela, do you want to take it from here? I would love to. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. This was amazing. I Pleasure. 
a lot of <laughs> notes myself and definitely uh, take advantage of uh, what uh, Anita suggested. Email her, request the ebook. It was a lot of information. Um, we are also offering a special offer for new users uh, because one of the reasons why we asked Anita, if she would be so generous with her time and uh, expertise and experience to come present to our customers is because we feel like there is a lot of um, lo like a good synergy between the product and her teachings. So if you are looking for for a solution that would help you to connect better with your customers, do the research, capture all the information necessary about them, take notes and keep them there so you you can always access it at uh when when you need it and you're not you're not forgetting the in, important things that you you learn about them by asking these amazing questions because as if you if you're making hundreds of calls uh <laughs> a week there's no way in in the world that you can uh you can remember all these things about you so we have a special offer you can you can uh, take advantage of a 30-day trial and if you if you like it if you feel like it would be a good good fit we also have a uh, promo code you can use to get three months for 40 percent off i want to take a look at the questions that came in um when we're talking about the active listening and i know you have a background in psychology owen had a uh, uh, observation saying that sounds like a Carl Rogers client therapist narrative. Do you want to address that? Yeah, I mean, what I can tell you is what I teach is a, it's kind of pulling together many different components within psychology and trying to figure out how to translate them into sales. It's not hard for any of us to go and go read books about psychology and look at the different um, psychologists and try to get things from them. What I'm trying to do is, I know my audience, I know salespeople don't have time to go through all the academia. And so I'm trying to filter and pull things from any different psychologist and figure out how we can apply it um, to real life. So is there a specific one I'm trying to mimic? Not really. Um, it's just kind of a pulling together the best of that I know will work for you and your opportunities. Awesome. Um, Craig has feedback. He says, great presentation. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Could we have a uh, copy of the slides? Yes, of course. Yep, I will pull that together for you. We've got some funky bills, so I'll clean that up and then I will um, send it to Nedia and she'll make sure that you guys all have it. Awesome. Uh, Tim also says, fabulous webinar. Thank you so much. Great info. Uh, Denise, thank you. Very interesting compilation of concepts as uh, applicable to sales. And we had a specific question from uh, Lynn. Uh, do you have examples of questions to actually ask the prospect or customer the questions you list for the answers? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where you go back to your high impact question. So, for example, if we're looking at um, why do you need to buy right now? One of the questions that you'd ask to kind of dig to see where they're at with that is, you know, uh, what's going on right now? Right. What's happening that's making literally asking the question, what's what's happening that's making you need to make this decision? Is there something that is going to be negatively impact if you don't make this purchase? Right. Just things like that. And these are basically the regular questions you would ask anyway. The reason the answers work so great is because we may think that we asked them and got the information, but sometimes we're going to miss them. And so the answers is kind of like your checklist to see, did I get that? Did I figure out the compelling event? Did I get the right information out the budget? Do I know who is going to be um, making this purchase from this company? It's your checklist. It's the questions that you would ask anywhere that you're trying to ask, but it's you going back and making yourself think like the customer to see if they've got the answers. We have more feedback. Nancy, looking forward to your slides. You are a captivating speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Edward, uh, hi there. Will you be posting a recording? My internet dropped out a few times. <laughs> yes. Sorry to hear that, Edward. Uh, not fun. We have recorded it. We will edit it and post it, uh, definitely. And we will also be sending a follow-up email to everybody that registered. So you will be able to access all the information including the recording. Let me check if we had more. It was a lot of great information. So again, I would love to encourage everybody to reach out to Anita, connect with her on LinkedIn, social media everywhere, reach out to her via email, request the ebook. And 
share your feedback. How did you like it? What did you learn? We have a survey that will be popping up on your screen at the end of the session and feel free to share it with us directly as well. Yes, and if you reach out, I'm happy. If you think of a question after we are disconnected here, just send me a note. I, I love to um, meet you all and kind of hear what you're, what's interesting to you. That helps me be sharp as well. Please do reach out. Thank you so much, Anita. This was amazing. Uh, we will stay in touch. Really appreciate you appreciate spending it. time with our audience and sharing, uh, sharing, sharing uh, this amazing value. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.